Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 22. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a rod, a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come down to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God.
We went to Acts 13 last week in our study through 1 Samuel. And we're going to return to it today. We introduced it last week. We tied it into the story of Saul and the story of David. Paul and his missionary friends are on their second missionary journey. Barnabas is here. Presumably there are others. They are in Antioch, Pisidia. This is one of the primary sermons, one of the main speeches in the book. The story of Acts, the book of Acts, centers primarily around several sermons, and this is one of those. This is an important sermon. It comes at the heels of a transition from the people of God, primarily Israel, into the new covenant, Gentile inclusion. The the book of Acts begins with Jesus' prediction that the Holy Spirit would come upon the disciples, making them apostles, and when that took place, they would be witnesses. Jesus is making a prediction, not a command in Acts chapter 1. This will happen, and when it happens, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. You know this verse, perhaps. What you might not know is that this verse is actually a geographical outline of the book. The book then is the, is the, 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 the gospel un- telling, the, the story unfolding of the gospel spread from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Acts 13 is a transition to the gospel spreading to all peoples. And in this sermon, Paul returns to the common message in the book. If you were to summarize all of Acts' sermons into one idea, in the New Testament we would call it the Apostles' Doctrine. And the Apostles' Doctrine is made very plain for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That he died according to the Scriptures that he was buried according to the Scriptures, and that he was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. And so it is this idea that we will, dis- we will discuss, we'll study in Acts 13 this morning. You know, sermons change and they develop, and the meaning doesn't change, but how you get to that meaning might, and my sermon changed last night, at least the introduction did, when something unexpected happens, happened. Now, I have three young children, and those of you who are parents know that when you have children, unexpected things happen all the time. One of my children, I'm really bad at you know, being subtle about which child it is from the pulpit. I'm sure you could figure it out based on those of you who know my children. But one of my children was bored, which is never a good thing for children, and was, was in his room, there it is, <laughs> and came out of his room and said, Dad, I have something to tell you. It was very straightforward. My son is many things, and honest is the first of them. He's just honest. He's not going to lie to you. He said, Dad, I have something to tell you. I said, what is it, bud? He said, I stuffed a Cheerio up my nose. <laughs> it's what children do. They stuff things up their nose. If you'd like a good story about me, ask my parents about the time that we were asked to do special music at a church one time, and um, what, what I did with the nickels that were in my pocket. Anyway, so Leighton, it's like, you know, mom and dad are different. Mom and dad are always, in every family, different. Usually, dad is the, they'll be fine one, and the mom is the sensible one who goes, maybe we should ask more questions. So I said, it's fine, you know, kids stuff things up their nose. It's, all right, all right. And I'll, I'll, I will pacify the concerns, and I'll call the on-call doctor just so we can be good. And So I called the on-call doctor, and I thought she'd be like, it's cereal, don't, you know, it's, it's fine. 
She said, no, things in the nose infect pretty easily. You should probably take them to urgent care. I mean, I was so excited to go tell my wife I was right. It's like, all right, bud. It's like, all right, man, let's go to the urgent care. And so we went to urgent care, and uh, we're sitting in the, you know, the, ch- the, the check-in place, and we're going through the process, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm checking in on my phone, and I pulled out my debit card to pay for our copay, and I paid for it. I look at late, and I said, that was an expensive Cheerio, son. I said, I think what I'm going to do is go home to your, was joking, go home to your piggy bank and I'm going to make you pay for it, knowing he didn't have the amount of the copay. He was, uh, apparently it didn't bother him. He just went, wait, right now? Like, you're going to do that right now? I said, maybe what I'll do is I'll make you do more chores to pay daddy back. Now, maybe if he were older, I would make him do that, but he's four, and four-year-old boys are going to put stuff up their nose. I say, where are you going with this? In that moment, I could have put my son in debt to me. I could have required something from him that would have imposed on him not only the financial debt of paying daddy back for a very expensive little piece of cereal, I mean, it wasn't that expensive, but it was too expensive for a piece of cereal. And all of the natural feelings that come along with that debt to daddy. I have to do more. I have to be better. I am indebted to someone. Someone has requirements over me. My friend, you might be visiting with us this morning. You may at times feel like you have to do better, be better, pacify the guilt that's inside you. Loved one, brother, sister in Christ, you may feel this morning like there are times you're not putting in enough church. You're not parenting your children well enough. You need to do better. You need to impress more. You need to be better. This morning, I want to show you that amongst many of the things that the resurrection accomplishes, and there's lots of deep theological directions we could go with it, this morning, I'm going to show you from this sermon One of the most astounding and beautiful and freeing realities of the resurrection. And it's this, that faith in the conquering Christ brings freedom and forgiveness. Faith in the conquering Christ brings freedom and forgiveness. We're going to read our text. It is somewhat of a lengthy text, and so I'm going to ask you to stick with me because I'd like to read the full sermon together, or at least most of the sermon together. And so I'm going to ask you to pay close attention to the text. It'll be just a minute or two of reading, and then we'll spend some time breaking it down. This is Acts 13. We're going to start in verse 16, and I'm going to read through verse 41, all right? So Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, and said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, Listen, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. 
of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John, that is the Baptist, had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and John was finishing his course. He said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize Him nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, the children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that though this man, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed, and everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perished, for I am, perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this passage. I ask that you'd cause us to be efficient, to say what you say with clarity. I pray that you would help us to see the power of the resurrection and our freedom from sin and our forgiveness of sin. I ask this morning for one who is not called out to Christ and salvation, they're running a hell-bound race that the Spirit of God would make them alive unto salvation through the Word of God. And I ask these things through our risen Lord. Amen. Well, I'm sure you noted some of the structure of the sermon. Paul preaches a biblical sermon, and he preaches a biblical sermon by starting with the Old Testament and then explaining it. This is what good preachers do. They start with a passage, and then they explain it. And really good preachers start at a passage, and they explain it, and they end up talking about Jesus. And that's what the apostle is going to do. So the first thing I want you to note in our text, in verses 16 and following, down to verse 26, is the foundation of salvation. The foundation of salvation. And what Paul does to build this foundation is he just walks through the history of Israel and he, he's going to go from the patriarchs in verse 17, the fathers, and then again the, he, mentions, he mentions Abraham in verse 26. He's going to start with God's beginning, his plan of redemption with the patriarchs, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he's going to move in verses 17 to 19 to the Exodus, the story that we know well. He, he made them great in Egypt, and Egypt was threatened, and he appoints Moses to go, let his people go, and then he strengthens Moses to stand up against Pharaoh, and Pharaoh makes the challenge, who is Yahweh? And Yahweh shows him. 
Ten plagues. And in the final one, Pharaoh says, all right, get them out of here. We'll pay you to go. Just go. The people are protected by the plague by, by taking a lamb and sacrificing the lamb and putting the blood over the doorway. And the firstborn in Egypt would pass away. And so then the people wander in the wilderness because of their griping and their disobedience to God, their rebellion. God says, he says, he says specifically, God put up with them in the wilderness. And then in verse 20, we, we note that, that there were specifically prophets raised up to give the message of God. And this took about 450 years, and after that, he gave them judges. And then he gave them Samuel the prophet. And so now, if, if, if you've been with us on Sunday mornings, we're going through 1 Samuel as a church body, as a church family. And so this is where we're studying, the, the, the period immediately following the judges and into the ministry of Samuel. Leading into, we just introduced him in verse uh, 21 and to 23 in the text, the kings. We, just, uh, we finished the, the idea of Saul's reign and the introduction to David, how David is going to overcome and be the true Old Testament fulfillment of the king, setting up who ultimately would come from his line. And that's the idea that Paul leans into in this text. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And then he leads to the New Testament. Paul brings us into the New Testament immediately preceding the life of Christ. And he talks about the prophet. There's prophets in the Old Testament. And he brings us to the prophet. John the Baptist, not the Savior himself, but the, you might say, the signpost to the Savior. John says, I'm not the guy. You should look at him. You should look at him. I'm not worthy even to untie his sandals. Isaiah 40 talks about the, the prophet who would precede Christ and make the way plain for the ministry of Christ to be brought upon the people. And so this foundation of salvation really just serves as an introduction to what God intends to do through Jesus. And so the th second thing I want you to note is the fulfillment of this foundation. The fulfillment of this foundation. In verses 27 through 37, we note the fulfillment in Christ, the foundation of our salvation, and secondly, fulfillment in Christ. Note with me verse 27, if you will. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize nor understand the utterance of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled. And what did they fulfill? They fulfilled things concerning Christ. And if you back up to verse 22, what they fulfilled was the message of this salvation. What is this salvation? Well, it's oriented around the person of God, the, or excuse me, the Son of God, Verse 24, or verse 23, of this man's offspring, that's David, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as He promised. And so this fulfillment of the foundation takes place in Christ and through Christ. What God does in the Old Testament leads to the climax of who Jesus is and the revelation of the Son of God, the Savior, who would bring this salvation. But I want you to note something that's interesting and almost ironic in the text. And to do this, I, I want you to see the confirmation of God's will. The confirmation of God's will. They did not, that's the people of Israel, the people who live in Jerusalem, verse 27, and their rulers did not recognize nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath. What's he saying? Every Sabbath, the Scriptures, the words of the prophets, the Old Testament is read, but the people of Israel who were hearing it, they didn't understand it. By the way, side note, if you want a text on why we should read the Bible before the preaching, there you go. They read the Scriptures every Sabbath before the explanation of it. 
But look what it says, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled. Who fulfilled? The enemies of God fulfilled the Scriptures. The people who opposed Jesus fulfilled the Scriptures. How? By condemning Him. Do you remember what we study, what we celebrate last week? We celebrate when the people of Israel welcome Jesus. Hosanna, this is Messiah. And then a week later, they're condemning him to death. Crucify him, crucify him. The option is given to, to, to give Barabbas a true criminal, a lawbreaker. And they say, no, we want Jesus, crucify Jesus. The governing, governing officials know that Jesus is innocent, yet He hands them over to die. They fulfilled the Scriptures. My friend, this morning, we are all working God's will. And we are either doing it in submission to Him, or we are bringing down His judgment upon us. By acting in disobedience. By not repenting, which we'll get to in a few moments. The rulers of Israel, they thought they were putting their enemy, Jesus Christ, to death. But God was using them to kill him and put him in a tomb so that he could conquer death. They fulfilled the Scriptures. Verse 28 is a reference to John 18 of Jesus before Pilate. And though they found no guilt in Him worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have Him executed. Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Put Him on the cross! And what does Pilate say? Do you remember that passage? John 18, Matthew 22, or Luke 22, excuse me. Do you know what Jesus said, or what Pilate says? He washes his hands before the people. And he says, This man's blood is not on my hands. Now there's a sense of irony there because it was. My friend, the blood of Christ is on everyone who's ever lived. You may think you stand before God in good place. I do good. I, I am good. I'm nice to people around me. We crucified the Savior. Our sin necessitated the sacrifice. So we note the confirmation, but the, th the second thing that I want you to see it leading into verse, uh, leading into the, the following texts where, where, where Paul himself uses the Old Testament as confirmation of the Messiah. Verse 30, God raised him from the dead. And when they'd carried out all that was written of him, what was written of him, these are the prophecies of, of, of Isaiah 53, of Isaiah 55, of his, all of the servant songs of his suffering. This is Psalm 22, which talks about his hunger and his thirst on the cross. The statements that he would make predicted in the Old Testament. They took him down from the tree, verse 29, and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. And then he gives evidential, he gives scriptural, like biblical evidence for why we should believe the resurrection. It happened as the scripture said. And then he gives evidential evidence for why we should believe the resurrection. People saw him, verse 31. And for many days he appeared to those who'd come up with him. People were seeing him after his resurrection. This defense of the resurrection of Christ in this text, we have biblical reason for it, and we have eyewitness account for it. The resurrection of Christ is believable. And this resurrection, this idea brings us into verse 32. This believability of the resurrection brings us into verse 32. And we bring you the, what's that next phrase? Good news. It's the New Testament word for gospel. 
We bring you the gospel. This is the good news. And loved one, brother or sister, we know the good news and we ought to rehearse the good news to ourselves regularly. But perhaps you're with us this morning and you've not called out to Christ and salvation. You need the good news. That by your sin, it necessitated a Savior. What we do to break God's law, what we think that's impure, what's in our heart that's rebellious towards Him. You need the good news of the gospel, that he died according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures, and that he was raised according to the scriptures. The good news of a conquering Savior. The good news of a conquering Savior. This is, verse 33, this is he that has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. In just a few moments, he's going to say, or earlier, excuse me, he said he raised up David as king. This word raising is different. And, and the way that it's, in, it's a different word for raising in, in the original language. And so the way that it's intended is to draw emphasis to the kind of raising that God did in Christ. It's not raising to a different level. It's raising to a different status. It's not like he just took up a step or he stood up. It's raised to a different status. And then the apostle is going to quote from the Old Testament. He's going to do it in connection to David. Remember, David's important here. Verse 33, this is he who's fulfilled to us, the children, by raising Jesus as it is written in the second psalm, Psalm 2. You are my son, God speaking of the son. And it seems like Psalm 2 is immediately fulfilled by David. But within the whole plan of God's story to forgive sin, Psalm 2 is ultimately fulfilled by Christ. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is the anointed one. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. Now when he says corruption there, he's not speaking metaphorically. He's talking about the corruption that takes place when you put a body in the ground. And they did not, they did not employ embalming methods for, for the, the, the longevity of a body like we do today, for the preservation of a body. When you put a body in the ground, it will corrupt. And now the specific contrast is made. Verse 35, he says in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One, that is Messiah, see corruption. The grave of Christ, the body of Christ will not corrupt. It didn't stay a corpse. The uncorrupted body of Christ saves us from the corruption of sin. And since Jesus' body didn't decay in the tomb, the decay of sin will not undo us. And then just in summary, in verse 36 and 37, Paul says, Our king, David, our man, the guy we love so much, he decayed in the tomb. But Jesus didn't. Why? Because he didn't stay there. He is not here. For he has risen. As he said he would. And I love the irony. And sometimes this irony escapes us. They're mocking of him on the cross. He said he would tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Is exactly what He did. What they meant as mockery, Christ meant to fulfill. It's almost like God says, watch this. And what does this accomplish? Let it be known to you, brothers, verse 38, 
that through this man, what man? The uncorrupted conqueror, he who was laid in the tomb, but that God through the Spirit resurrected through him is forgiveness of sins proclaimed to you. This word forgiveness in the New Testament is the idea of has the idea of cancellation on the basis of a debt that is owed, which is why I began the way that I did. Do you think this morning that what you need to do to be accepted by God is to come to church? Your good needs to outweigh your bad. Your inner morality needs to overtake your outward immorality. And maybe when you stand before God one day, He'll just think you're good enough. Loved one, and I'm speaking to the believers in the room for just a moment. Can you just stop with me and meditate for a moment in the joy of your heart that on this day, Resurrection Day, everything that you did outside of God's law, everything you've ever thought, jealousy, envy, impurity, everything that you said Maybe to the person that's most important to you in the world, that you love more than anybody, all of it is gone. It's gone. Forgiven. I love, I love what Martin Luther tells about his testimony of his inner meditations of forgiveness. Luther says, one, one day the devil came to me and he brought a long sheet containing a list of sins, a sins of great number. And Luther said, that can't be all of them. No, said the devil. I'll go and fetch some more. Away went Satan and brought me another list and the list was extending to my arm. And Luther said, is that all? Oh no, said the devil, I have more yet. Well, go and bring them all, said Luther. Fetch them all out, a whole list, complete it. And he came back with a very long list indeed. I think that perhaps it would have gone around the world twice. And I said when I saw them all, right at the bottom, the blood of of Jesus cleanses from all sin. And how is this possible? How does the blood cleanse? How are they gone? Colossians 2, having been buried with Him, in which you were also raised with Him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. How is sin forgiven? Verse 14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us. Loved one, when Jesus died in the tomb, your record of debt died with him. And he did not bring it out of the tomb. The believer's debt died with Jesus. An empty tomb means an emptied sin vault. And as he walked unfettered and whole from death, as though he had never sinned because he didn't, so now we walk with newness of life as though we never sinned, though we did. Are you living forgiven this morning? Brother, sister, are you living forgiven this morning? Are you continually bearing 
continually bearing the guilt that was born once for you. And you constantly go back to it. Live in the joy of forgiveness. Perhaps this morning, the way that you're not living out for your forgiveness is you're withholding that which you've been given. God's grace is good enough for you, but it's not good enough for somebody else. And you refuse to forgive. He has made us alive unto salvation for the forgiveness of sins. And so we of all people must extend what has been eternally extended to us. And very briefly, what else has this accomplished? And this is so fascinating. I want you to see this. He is actually not saying that forgiveness accomplishes freedom or that the resurrection accomplishes freedom which accomplishes forgiveness. He's saying the resurrection accomplished two things in the text. Now, naturally, we feel more free when we are forgiven, but there are two doctrinal gospel pictures given in the text. Let it be known to you, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed. Freed. And so I want you to note in verse 39 with me the freedom that we have through Christ. The freedom that we have through Christ. I just want to speak to those of you in the room who are visiting with us this morning. I assume even the, many of the visitors who are with us could have called out to Christ and salvation. I don't know. I'm very hesitant to assume that. But if you have not done that, I don't intend to offend you, but can I tell you something? You came in like this today. If you have entered Grace Bible Church without calling out to Christ and salvation, you enter like this. Not free. In bondage. John tells us in, in 1 John, to Satan. Bondage to Satan. And bondage to sin. And those masters will only drag you to hell. This man gives freedom. This elsewhere is translated justify. He made you innocent on the basis of his innocence. It's as though we stood before God in chains and Christ enters our courtroom and says, I'll take the shackles. I'll take the suffering. I'll take the death. And on the basis of His purity and holiness and innocence, we are declared righteous, declared pure, declared innocent before the Father. And we're free. Christ was handed over to the torturers for us. You say, I didn't come here on Easter to hear a hellfire and damnation message. I came here because that's what you're supposed to do on Easter. You're supposed to dress yourself up and take pictures and come to church. Can you just listen to me for one more moment? If you're here without Christ, I want to share with you one of my favorite passages in all the world. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. From the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened or inhibited by the flesh, limited by the flesh, could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. So trace this with me for just a moment. Before God, without Christ, we stand condemned. 
but before God having called out to Christ, rather than condemning us, He condemns our sin. Condemned sin. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How in the world does this take place? The Spirit of God frees us from the law. And how? You guessed it. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. So how are we freed? How are we justified? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. If he raised Christ Jesus from the dead, lives in you. He will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit. How is life attained? How is freedom given? He died according to the Scriptures. He was buried according to the Scriptures. And He was raised according to the Scriptures. And so the words of our Lord ring ring true in John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Perhaps you're not living in freedom today. Loved one, brother, sister, live in the freedom of our justification. Live out pleasure to our Savior rather than living in liberty to yourself. Live not according to the condemnation of the law, but in the liberty of Christ. Don't fall back into that which Christ died and was raised to deliver you from. And finally, and just to draw this all to a close, let's close the way Paul does. It's almost like Paul's invitation. Every good sermon explains a passage of Scripture, talks about Jesus, and then demands accountability. Verse 40, beware, therefore, beware. Pay attention. Take heed to this. Be warned. Therefore, what is said in the prophets should not come about. Don't let this be true of you. They ignored the prophets concerning Christ. Don't let this be true of you. Look, you scoffers. You know what the scoffer says? No God for me. I'm good. I've got this. I can save myself. I'm good enough. I'd rather do it my own way. Thanks. Be astounded and perish. For I'm doing a work in your days that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Someone is telling you of the work right now. Call out in faith to Christ for salvation. May the Spirit of God make you alive unto salvation today. Repent and believe is the summary of verse 40. Repent and believe. Loved one, I'm very thankful. My friend, visitor, I'm I'm very thankful you're here. There's no accident. God wanted me in this text with you here in the seat wherever you are. Beware. Jesus saves. And He saves because He did not corrupt in the tomb. He conquered it. Would you pray with me?